Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kevin Spacey. Welcome. Welcome to France. Please join. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> How are you, Sam? Very good, very good. Welcome. Thank you. So this uh, season four premieres on Netflix in France for the first time. Uh, How does it feel to be here and to celebrate it? Well, um, every time I've come to France uh, since we launched House of Cards, um, I have to say uh, the French people have embraced the show and the character. I, I, I have not been able to walk down the street or go into a restaurant without people either coming up and being incredibly uh, friendly and very kind or, or being slightly afraid and staying away from me. <laughs> Did, how do you, uh, in the whole breadth of your work, where does Francis Enderwood live for you? Um, well, the challenge uh, of, of taking on a character that has so much complexity. Um, I was really blessed when we began to have had the idea and the notion of, of, of taking on this role with, with David Fincher and then Bob Willimon, who was our showrunner. Um, and these two men who are so creative and so challenging and so precise uh, in the way in which they work with actors and, and in terms of the precision of the, the writing, um, that I have to say I think Francis is probably one of the most remarkable characters I've ever been able to play. Um, and, and the great fun for me is that with each season, I learn new things about this man, um, and obviously all the relationships that he has, but also the relationship that he has with the audience, which is, which is incredible fun. Um, and I think that I'm enormously grateful for the experiences I had before taking on Francis. I had the chance to play Richard III, uh, with, to some degree, that the, the character of Francis Urquhart in the original British series, and then Underwood, which we named him in the American series so that we could retain the initials F.U. <laughs> uh, I got to do Richard III with Sam Mendes before we started production. And I also think that the work that I was able to do at the Old Vic in the 10 years um, before, really before we started, the sort of nine seasons I was there before we started, was also really important in helping me grow as an actor, and I, I feel like all of that work helped me prepare to tackle uh, such a complex man. So your performance and the, your ability to create it on the heels of Richard III kind of rooted it more in Shakespeare in a way, in a way that, that made it not feel as American, made it feel much more global? Like yeah, definitely that? global, and I think, um, you know, while there are many people who probably believe that direct address was invented by Ferris Bueller. <laughs> it was actually invented by Shakespeare. Uh, and he created it in Richard III, which is different from in Shakespeare the monologue or the prologue, um, where a, a, a character might speak to the whole audience. Direct address is literally looking at individual members of the audience. Um, and having had that experience of taking Richard III around the world and being able to look into the eyes of audiences everywhere, in Asia, in Turkey, in London, in New York, in San Francisco. And it was a really remarkable experience to see how much um, audiences dig being in on the know. You know, there's a kind of complicity that I think even now our audiences in House of Cards really enjoy the sense that they're in on the private thoughts uh, of this man, Francis Underwood. Of course, they, you know, as as things happen and things unveil themselves, they might get a little scared that they've been supporting this guy. But that's the sort of wonderful moral ambiguity uh, uh, of what the audience goes through, as well as the characters. Are you ever surprised, from country to country, how people uh, perceive Francis and how they how they talk to you about Francis? Uh, yes, because. I mean, I suppose it's interesting simply because 
the show has been so successful in so many countries, um, it seems to translate borders. Um, and I don't think it's only because people are fascinated with American politics, but because the politics of life are all over the world and all over the globe. So it, it, it's, it's been very interesting to see how people identify um, with these characters so much, regardless of where they're from. And, and uh, on top of having this great kind of gift of having a great character, but you've also got to make a lot of television history with this show. Um, launching all, all, all of them at once, the 26th episode order, the first uh, television show to win a primetime Emmy, having never aired on television. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what gave you the courage to, to jump into something like that? Well, I mean, it starts obviously with the show, with David Fincher, with Bo Willimon. Um, and you know, when, you well remember when we had the idea, we went and we pitched uh, the, the idea of the program to all of the networks. And every network thought it was a really interesting idea, and every network was really engaged and kind of wanted to do it with us, but every network insisted that we do a pilot, except one. And uh, Ted, you know, they did their remarkable analytics and had a sense, I think, that audiences would dig something that was a political drama with Fincher and myself involved. And, and you guys turned to us and said, no, we, we, we don't need you to do a pilot. How, how many do you want to do? And we were like, um, two seasons? <laughs> it's the worst negotiation of all time. <laughs> well, actually, you know, part, part of what made it exciting for us was that Netflix was so willing to be courageous and step forward. It, it, it absolutely made sense to me that one of the major companies that had done very well as a portal for content, and Netflix had done extremely well, was eventually going to get into the game of saying, well, if we want to compete, we're going to have to start doing original content. So it didn't surprise me that, A, a company stepped forward. What surprised me was that a company stepped forward with such courage and such a big commitment, um, and went forward with an idea uh, and believed in it and gave us as creators uh, a really long runway to be able to tell uh, the complex story we wanted to tell. How much of that, of the success of the show, you think is tied to the, the length of the commitment and the infrastructure that goes with that? And I think a lot of it. I mean, I think that it's, it's an exciting thing to be able to say that we have um, partners who trust the creative vision that we had, um, who were willing to um, take the long view rather than the short view. Um, and through the process of discovering that audiences love being in control, and you know, as you well remember, there were many discussions about how should we release it, should we do this many, and then this many, and this many, and ultimately the notion that you could drop the entire season at once. That the water cooler moment for audiences has expanded and changed. It's no longer necessarily in the office anymore. It's it's online, and luckily we live in a pretty non-spoiler generation, so um, that's been pretty cool to see how people have understood. You know, I, I, keep, I can't talk about any of the specifics in the show, and people get frustrated by that, but I say I can't be the spoiler-in-chief, <laughs> because there are people who are just now, this, this year, discovering season one. Yeah. Um, particularly in countries where Netflix is, is now going to finally be, um, and we have to sort of recognize that everyone will catch up to the show when, when they want to and when they can, um, but it's a kind of exciting thing that it's there and that people can always see it. It, it kind of started its own etiquette, <laughs> when, when you could talk about things, how you could talk about things. And, and um, you're, uh, you, you told a great story about um, China and how you were, your, your reaction with the fans in China. Yes, the, it's, the show is very huge. I, I, I did a film in China a couple of years ago, and I could walk down the street in Guangzhou with my friend Daniel Wu, who was the star of this film I did, this fully financed Chinese film. And, and being with him in China is like being with Tom Cruise. And he's a huge star. 
and next to him, everyone thought I was his bodyguard. <laughs> and then a few years later, I went to Macau uh, about a year and a half ago to do a concert in Macau. And I walked onto the stage, this is now House Cards have been playing for about a year, and yeah. two years. I walked onto the stage and it was as if some rock star had walked onto the stage. 300 Chinese raced the stage and spent the entire concert taking selfies with me in the background. <laughs> and I got back to Hong Kong the, that night and I asked a number of friends of mine, what the fuck has happened since I was last in China? He said, oh, how surprised. So big in China. I said, well, that, that I mean, I can, I've ever heard and understand that the Chinese government rather enjoy it. <laughs> and he said, yes, that, that is true. But he said, also for the common man, Francis Underwood is perceived as someone fighting against corruption. <laughs> <laughs> Always lost in translation it sometimes. Took me, yeah, yeah. It took me about a day and a half to get my head around that. Um, <laughs> But yes, the, the show, the character, has, has become very popular. Yeah. Yeah, I should note that in China it's uh, available on a uh, transactional and as a VOD service. Uh, but it's wildly, wildly popular, like it is everywhere else in the world. Um, we wanted to open it up and, uh, to you to ask some questions from Kevin. Um, you just shout it out, and we've got some folks with microphones who will come up to you. Just, here we got a hand right here. Hello, thank you very much. I'm uh, Jesus from Spain. I have to ask about the uh, season five because uh, Bob Williamson has the, the show as a runner. I want to know if, if uh, the show is going to have a different variation now that, that Bo is not there. Well, Bo was very tired. Uh, he's been working nonstop since we began. He's a remarkable man. We've had an incredible experience, and, and without question, I'll, I'll miss him being there every day. But the writer's room is the same writers uh, that we had in season four. Nothing has changed in terms of uh, the quality of the work that we're going to, to be doing. Uh, and we are, have now been uh, working toward, uh, you know, Bo and I began these conversations as we did every year, sort of about midway through the shooting of the previous season. So much has been discussed, much has already been put on the table, lots of very interesting ideas. Um, and. Uh, and we're excited now that, that the writing process is, is happening and, uh, and we will begin season five soon enough. It should be noted, Bo uh, has his, a place in television history. That's his first television show he's ever done with House of Cards. It's pretty phenomenal. Right over here. Mr. Can you talk a little bit about, about working with you and Shinnaman in season four? Working with who? You and Shinnaman. I didn't understand. Working in cinema? Jewel Shinnaman, the Swedish actor. Ah, oh, the Swedish actor. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes, sorry. Uh, it, I've had an incredible time. Uh, it's funny, he's challenging. Uh, uh, we have uh, very much enjoyed working with each other. Uh, he's also a stage actor, he does a lot of theater. Um, and and uh, talent definitely runs in that family. <laughs> Mr. Spacey, um, given that we're in the uh, run-up to the presidential election, um, do you mind sharing how do you think he, uh, Mr. Underwood compares to the most interesting candidates? <laughs> well, um, you know, we just need to remember that he's a fictional character. <laughs> <laughs> and that some of the candidates running appear to be fictional characters. <laughs> uh, and it's just very interesting that the, 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 the parallel universe uh, that we always intended as we moved forward, knowing that there would be an election, um, so that there is a parallel election happening on, on the show. It's just been very interesting, I think, for um, audiences everywhere, but maybe particularly American audiences, to um, look at politics, look at how we expose things in our program and that there are many times when we will finish a sequence um, we'll have a storyline that we will be attacking and I will leave the set and I will go to my hotel room and I will wonder have we gone too far 
<laughs> have we crossed the Rubicon? Is there something we've done that feels unreal and, and kind of unbelievable and kind of crazy? And then I turn on the television. <laughs> and I watch the news. And I think we haven't gone far enough. You're friendly with Bill Clinton. What does what Bill think of Francis? I love that house of cards. <laughs> right, Jenny? Ask, what, what other politicians over here? Uh, over here. Yeah, have you talked to other politicians about what they think of House of Cards? Yes, I, I've been involved in, in, the, in the political world for a very long time, so I, I, I know that world, and I know a lot of politicians, Republicans and Democrats. And quite frankly, I hear both ends of the spectrum. I hear those that say it's a very cynical, uh, very, uh, it's just dramatic, it's not real, it has nothing to do with the way things are. And, and then I, I speak to other politicians who say it's closer to the truth than anyone would like to know. So I, I've heard both sides of it. Um, but, but no matter what, Democrats, Republicans in, in my country, people seem to really dig the show. Um, whatever side of the political spectrum they come down on. Uh, hi. Go next door. Okay, so we, I guess we all agree that uh, most of us do watch TV series on smartphones like that. And did you ever imagine that people are going to watch you on things like that? And what's your opinion about it? It doesn't bother you. I, I hope I fill your screen. That's all I <laughs> uh, We'll get time for one last question. Go. Uh, Right here, stretcher. Oh, see you up here. There we go. Thank you, thank you. My name is Giza Chakori, I'm from Hungary, and I was lucky enough to see you on stage in Ulrich playing with Richard III. Uh, for me, that performance was back to basics. I'm a bit Shakespeare and with acting, so I would like to uh, ask you for a follow-up that you mentioned that you learned a lot as an actor, by that production, what you used in this series, so can you uh, tell us something about this a little bit deeper? Yes, I can just tell you that when I made the decision uh, in the year 2000 to move to London to start a theater company, to do a play every year or two plays every year for what became a 12 year. Uh, time, that I was at a place where I wanted to challenge myself in a different way than I had been challenging myself in film. I, I didn't want to fall into uh, making a lot of movies I probably shouldn't make. And that I wanted to become a better actor. And that I know now as I sit here that the 12 or so plays, or 13 plays I did in the period of time from 2003 until I left the Old Vic last August changed me to work with Trevor Nunn, to work with Matthew Warchus, to work with Sam Mendes, to work with Thea Sherrick, to work with the actors I worked with, the kind of parts I did, the fact that you get up every single night um, and that you can get better is like, for me, it's like tennis, you know, it's like you get up, uh, you know, eight times a week and you play tennis, it's, it's the same rules, but it's a different game. And for an actor like myself who I learn so much from the doing, the act of being watched, the changes that you go through when you learn about a character and about yourself and about an audience every night, um, I, I know for myself but that I, I would never have been prepared to take on the role of Frank Underwood 12 years ago. But all the work I've done since I, I went to the Old Vic, I, I believe, helped prepare me for being able to play a character on a very wide and large landscape. So there's a certain theatricality to the character, but also try to maintain a, a sense that he's a real person and, and be grounded um, is, is for me all, all about the theater. Well, thank you, uh, Kevin, for being here. And on behalf of everyone at Netflix and for myself, uh, it's been a really uh, 
has been and continues to be a great honor to bring you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to, to your world. new talk show on Netflix. Yes. Yes. I, uh... <laughs> it's going to be very short-lived. <laughs> Thank you again. We're going to turn it back to Jonathan. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you.